Hi, my name is Anne McElhenney. And I'm Phil McAleer. And welcome to the Anne and Phil Scoop. Yes. It's the middle of July. No, it's not the middle of July. It's the beginning of July. That's kind of middle-ish. Middle-ish of July. Yes. We're still in lockdown, by the way. Yes. We're still in lockdown. We're still in, we're now in week 14. Of the two-week lockdown. Of the two-week lockdown. Um, and basically, in almost all parts of the world, people are still in lockdown. I think yes. maybe the Italians are out. I think the Italians are out, pretty much. That's in all, fact, it's all Trump's fault. Apparently, it's all Trump's fault. By the way, on today's show, we have Eric Metaxas, the wonderful Eric Metaxas, author, speaker, inspirational speaker, um, and also radio host. You probably know him best for his book, Bonhoeffer, uh, about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But he writes children's books also. It's a, it's a great interview. He talks a lot about Bonhoeffer. He talks a lot about his children's books. He talks about his, his Trump children's books. He's books yes. Uh, for, Dr- drain the Swamp. Uh, yeah. Donald Drain the Swamp. Yeah, but, Donald so, Build the Wall. There, there, if you walk into any bookstore nowadays, you'll see lots of leftist books aimed at children. He decided to address the balance. It's a great interview. It's very, very wide ranging. You won't want to miss it. So that's what we got. And uh, before we get there, we had a very interesting weekend last weekend, hadn't we, Anne? We had a very interesting weekend. So we decided to, to create um, an Independence Day autonomous zone on the beach at Venice, at Venice Beach here. This, and is, this is a response to the governor and the mayor closing down the beach, promoting protest two weeks ago. Tens of thousands of people on the street. Uh, but from, but banning people, law-abiding people from the beach on, over the Independence Day weekend. And we decided that if protesting is okay, that we would have a, a, a kind of a fake protest. So we declared Venice Beach an Independence Day autonomous zone. So it's everyone, kind of an op- it was an opinion piece, really. Yes, it was a piece of journalism. Of journalism. Uh, opinion piece. But so, so if, you'll see the picture now if you're watching this on YouTube. We got the drone up with the banner. Big 30 foot by 6 foot Beautiful banner. Beautiful banner. But a very interesting story about the banner. Really interesting story. So Magda, who you guys know, we always mentioning Magda here on the show. Magda went to pick up the banner. Um, from a random banner shop. From a shop. random banner shop, a place that did printing here in Los Angeles, whatever. We don't, I don't even know where it is, by the way. And so she Burbank. goes, she go in Burbank. So she arrives at the premises and sort of realizes she didn't have her mask and she kind of apologizes to the guy, whatever. And the guy who's there inside the business is really nice and has a big smile as she walks in and he says to her, I've been listening to your podcast. And she's like, this is great. And I'm going to watch, and I, I love you guys, he says, and I'm going to watch the Gosnell movie tonight. And she's delighted, obviously. And then she goes inside the shop and obviously, you know, they're organizing to get the banner and all of this. And then while that's all happening, he tells her his story. And this man's name is what film? Uh, Cody. Casey. Casey Diaz. Casey Diaz. So back in the day, this, this guy, when he was a young man, a very young man, got involved in very bad gangs. 16, 17. When he was 16, 17, he was from a bad family. His family situation was bad. He kind of went out in the street, joined these really bad gangs and got involved in extremely bad behavior. And he said, to, I think to Magda, that he, she, he's lucky. He didn't want to tell her the, the worst of what he did. He was tried as like an a, adult. Yeah, at, at 16, 17, he was tried as, 16, he was tried as an adult. He got 13 years. Three of them in solitary confinement. Yeah, well, that's when he went in. He he got that. He got 13 years, but his, his most overwhelming emotion when he got 13 years was relief because they didn't get him for everything he'd done. And if he, if he, if they had, he would never have got out of prison. But he went in bad, stayed bad, and then and then he found Jesus and had a massive, an extraordinary, amazing conversion experience. And then he converted two other, 200 other inmates in the same prison. He came out, he's written an incredible book about it, which we're Called showing... Called The Shot Caller. Now, The Shot Caller is the person in prison who hides the knives and the shanks. And uh, when somebody is going to kill someone else, they're the one that supplies the appropriate knife and the appropriate shank. Uh, for so he's people. written this incredible book, became a massive bestseller. Lots of people interviewed him. Um, and then people started asking him that they, want, that he, you know, they wanted to make a movie of his life. And he got offered a big, big, big money deal from I, Sony. from I think Sony. Sony's fifth wing. From their fifth wing. And he basically said he turned it down because he was scared that they would do to his life story, which is all about Jesus, that they would do what was done to 
um, Zamperini. Zamperini's life story in Unbroken, where yeah. the book of Unbroken makes it very clear that the most significant thing that ever happened to Louis Zamperini was his God. conversion and meeting Jesus, basically. That, that was the most important thing. And then we had Angelina Jolie made a movie and left that out. Just left it out yeah. completely. So he didn't, it. So didn't he... want that. So now the movie has been made by a different group and apparently it's coming out next year. You let us know if you think we should have Casey Diaz on this show, on the podcast. Let us know and write to us. You can write to us um, on YouTube. You can leave it in a message or you can leave it on anywhere on, on the, the podcast. podcast app. So there's the book. If you're watching this on YouTube, it's called The Shot Caller. It's Casey Diaz with Mike Yorkey. Um, well, we haven't read it yet, but he was very kind to give us some it's copies. It's published by Thomas Nelson. So and we're very interested. It looks great. So. We're, we're interested in talking to him. Uh, but we're going to go to our interview that we did earlier with Eric Metaxas let's, right now. Let's go over to that now. Uh, we're joined now by Eric Metaxas. Uh, he is a, a New York Times bestseller, author of many, many books. His books include Martin Luther, If You Can Keep It, Miracles, Seven Women, Seven Men, uh, Amazing Grace. He's written more than 30 children's books. Uh, including the bestsellers Squanto and the Miracle of Thanksgiving. Um, he's, the author, he's the host of the Eric Metaxas radio show, uh, a nationally syndicated radio program in more than 120 cities. Uh, he was, he's been the keynote speaker at the 2012 National Prayer Breakfast. Uh, President Obama, I believe, uh, was hosted it. Um, ABC News has described Eric as uh, a photogenic witty ambassador for faith in public life nice yes well this is abc news <laughs> um and the Indian, indianapolis star described him as a protestant version of william f buckley hmm. which i thought william f buckley was a protestant so did i no he's a catholic no no he's everyone thinks that because he sort of seems to define wasp but in fact he was very catholic that's right correct he was All right, right. Now, now that i remember uh, founder and host of Socrates in the City, Conversations on Examined Life, his website of entertaining and thought-provoking discussions on life, God, and other minor topics. Yeah. Um, so in September 2013, Eric and his wife Suzanne were award, jointly awarded the Human Life Review's Great Defender of Life Award. Uh, he's best known, and really how we came across him, was his book Bonhoeffer. Um, it's... The, the life story of the amazing uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer won the 2011 John C. Pollock Award for Biography, a 2011 Christopher Award in the nonfiction category. It's just basically won every award you can win. Including about. the important award to people who write books of having people buy the book. Yes. Um, so um, over a million people to date, I think, have bought the book, including yes. yours truly. Yes. Um, it's uh, it's just it's an amazing book and we'll, 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 and we'll, we'll, we'll talk, talk about, about that. Um, it's he also uh, he's all, obviously a, a New York Times bestseller. Um, he did an op-ed. Eric did an op-ed. And we'll talk about this as well for the Wall Street Journal, which is a uh, which is entitled "Science Increasingly Makes the Case for God," and it's apparently one of the most popular and most shared pieces in the history of the Wall Street Journal. And uh, in, in a, a stunning achievement, his, his, well, yeah, I want to talk about his humor writing now. He writes, he's written humorous pieces for the Atlantic Monthly and the New York Times. And in what is perhaps the biggest and highest praise anyone could have in, one's, in a career as a writer, the, the great Woody Allen has described these pieces as quite funny. Um, so I want to talk to you later on about the word quite, by the way, because it's, become, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, American word uh, and Irish word and British word. But for right now, we want to say welcome to Eric Metaxas to the Annan Film Scoop. Well, I'm thrilled. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here and just thrilled to talk to the, the two of you anytime. You're just fun to talk to. And that's my arbiter for everything. If it's fun, there must be something good in it. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you very much. So how have you? So you have been in New York for the pandemic, for the 2020 pandemic? I was born in New York. I live in New York. Uh, we've raised our daughter in New York. And uh, I have to say, you know, the funny thing about news uh, or about media in general is it distorts things because you would get the idea that, uh, you know, everything's going haywire in New York. But New York's a very big city. Even Manhattan is very big. And so when you see things or hear things, uh, it doesn't necessarily apply uh, to, to everywhere. So w we have had a 
strangely blessed time uh, during this uh, pandemic. Our daughter was home from college, so that was a, a boon to us. And uh, the quiet, the strange quiet was a, was a real blessing to me. And, and because I was unable to go, normally I travel a lot and do a lot of public speaking. That's one of the main ways that uh, I pay the rent. Yeah. And all of that was shut down. So I was forced to stay home and uh, in a way it enabled me to write and I've begun a new book. So it's been a mostly a good, good time uh, in my life. Although obviously I appreciate that it hasn't been so wonderful for most people. That's great, Eric. We're glad that you're, you're doing okay in, in New York. Uh, if, you, if you and if the listeners heard a strange crying noise there, that was our cat, Scaredy Cat. Uh, who, who, has been, who has been out all night without permission. Yes. And has just come home. And, and, and he's the one crying. We should be the, we're the one, I'm the one who was awake all night worried about him. It's always possible because cats don't talk that he's, uh, he's part of the Antifa madness and not telling his parents. Uh, you might want to look into that. You think, yes. he's, you think he's out there tearing down statues to cats? He's looting and uh, you need to confront him. Yeah. Okay. Well, his name is Mr. Scaredy Cat, and he kind of hides behind that personality difficulty that he has. What about the riots that happened in New York? The thing is, if you live on the Upper East Side, as we do, you're just far north enough to escape uh, whatever trouble has been happening further south. If the, the, There were a couple of days where you thought that these uh, crowds might continue all the way north up Madison Avenue or wherever they're going. I don't know. But... Uh, thankfully, that, that didn't happen. But look, let's face it. We have, for the first time in America, seen clearly the choice between basic common sense government and woke PC madness that you get from the cultural Marxists. And our own mayor uh, is a radical leftist. I don't mean a Democrat, because we've had wonderful democratic mayors. He is a radical leftist, and we know that the, the Democrats in America have, have sprinted uh, leftward uh, into cultural Marxism. And so the idea that one of the safest cities in the world has suddenly become dramatically less safe, uh, you know, that's, it, it's a warning to most Americans in case they forgot what this kind of government or lack of government can look like. It's very real here in New York, I'll be honest. It's very real here and, of course, in other major cities around the country. Have you thought of leaving New York? I mean, there's obviously, we're reading a lot of stories. There's these pattern stories in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal of huge migration out of New York to the Catskills and to Florida and, and elsewhere. Oh, no, I mean, it, look, it, it, in some ways it makes sense to, to leave New York. We feel called here by God, if I can... Uh, be dramatic about it. And unless uh, he were to open some door dramatically uh, himself, I don't really, I don't, I don't know where else we would want to go. We're midway between my wife's family in New Jersey and my own family in Connecticut. And we're grateful uh, uh, to have our parents. And so we want to spend time with them. So where we are now for many reasons is a, it's a good place to be, but I think many people, whether they say so or not, are thinking about leaving, you know, New York and other places like New York. There's, there's simply no question of it. So, what do you think about the state of America right now? I mean, a lot of people are, are scared. I think a lot of people have been very shocked by recent events, the toppling of the statues, um, the woke, cult, the woke culture that you just recent, just mentioned there earlier. I, I think this has been happening over decades, slowly. And because of Trump, who is obviously a polarizing figure, the, the left has, in, in a sense, been flushed from the bushes. They, they were mostly hiding about some of their uh, innate philosophies, uh, which, which are culturally Marxist. But I think something about Trump and something about circumstances has forced them to come out. And in a way, I think it's very healthy for Americans to see what that vision of America looks like. It's an anti-American vision of America. It's a snake eating its own tail. It's a, a tautology, it's self-refuting, it's madness. And uh, most people, whether they'll say so in a poll or not, know that that's not the direction they wanna go in. It's, it's one thing to vote 
for a Democrat. But when the Democratic Party has been taken over by, as I say, culturally Marxist forces, and I'm not speaking hyperbolically, I mean genuinely, that is what is at play. You know, you give up safety, you give up the basics of freedom, most of which you probably took for granted. Many of us in America, we've been so blessed. We've taken all these things for granted. We've, uh, you know, uh, been uh, under the illusion that this is normal. Well, freedom and prosperity are not normal around the world. Uh, the two of you know that, and I know that. My parents came from Europe, where they experienced the horrors of the Second War. So I was raised to understand that the, the, the freedom and the prosperity that we have here is not normal. And so for your average American to get a glimpse of how fragile it is and what we must do to keep the republic, to use Franklin's famous phrase, I think it's a healthy thing and it will be a healthy thing going into this election to have a dramatic choice. Are you hopeful of what, what do you hope for in the election? I don't have any doubt that Donald Trump will win re-election. I think it will be a real battle. Um, but I think the uh, what used to be called the silent majority, people that are just trying to raise their kids and get on in life, they understand when somebody goes too far. Uh, they know that basic law and order uh, is not to be confused with police brutality or, uh, you know, bad apples murdering people or any of that. They, they, they see rather clearly the difference between what it is to reform some police departments and what it is to defund the police and to say that law and order is inherently uh, patriarchal, white supremacist. I mean, all that stuff is so ridiculous, so patently ridiculous. But the thing is, in the media, you tend not to hear those voices of common sense so much. You, you only really see, uh, in a way, the mainstream uh, media has, they've been apologists for the madness. They've been disinclined to point out the inconsistencies. And so I think most Americans sitting at home, they see this and uh, they are not going to allow the country to descend into chaos so that, you know, 25 people uh, can feel heroic about themselves. I mean, this is really about uh, preserving n not just our nation, but uh, what Lincoln called the last best hope of earth. Our way of life here in America is something that's not meant to be just for us. It's meant to be a beacon to the whole world of how is it possible to govern ourselves, not to be governed from uh, some tyrannous bureaucracy or from a, 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 a single tyrant, but for people to govern themselves. We've lost sight of that. As you both know, I've, I've written about it and I've thought about it and talked about it a lot. And I really think that this is, it's a time when we get to see it more clearly and get to see what happens if we don't take our citizenship and our uh, duty to govern ourselves seriously. So I, I think it's, as I say, it's a good thing. I don't have any doubt that Trump will be reelected and polls mean absolutely nothing at this point. I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, you know, it, it, it just becomes ridiculous. We're a nation addicted to polling and it's very silly. You think we'd have gotten over the polling uh, issues we had with the last elections when they were when they were so proved wrong? Yeah, I mean, well, I, I just want to say about polling. I mean, given that that supporting Trump is 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 a capital offence, and I don't mean that uh, metaphorically. Now, uh, I mean if you'd walked into you know a lot of places or been at any of those uh, protests and said you you thought that President Trump wasn't wasn't a monster. You could literally have died. They, the mob could literally have torn you apart. If someone phones you at home at night on your, on your, on your cell phone and says, "Who are you going to? Who are you going to vote for in the next election?" Who in their right mind is going to say President Trump? But you don't know the identity of the person at the other end of the phone. Yeah. And also, Phelan, I have to say that most Americans, like me, are deeply offended by the idea that the man America elected, not his base, America chose Donald Trump as president. So the idea that this is somehow out of bounds or it's hate mongering or it's racist is deeply offensive to most Americans. And it's why they will vote for him again. And it's why they will be happy to vote for him again, because th this kind of um, politically correct, as we say, culturally Marxist madness, it's like the cultural revolution in China. It's out of the pit of hell. And most Americans 
see that this is not the American way. It's never been the American way. And uh, I, I think that, as I say, people are people are marking this because this is it's deeply un-American and unacceptable. And we you know, we have to act against it. We can't just think against it. We have to act against it. And that means at least voting. We want to s switch uh, tone a little bit here and talk about the Bonhoeffer book. And uh, I'm reminded that, you know, we met when our book came out, the Gosnell book, and we met and you kindly, very kindly interviewed us about that. And then and then about two days later, we very surprisingly got invited to the White House um, for an event there prior to the March for Life. And lo and behold, who was there as well but yourself? Um, and I remember having a brief, a brief conversation with you um, and just talking about the Bonhoeffer book and what it had meant to me. And you said, sometime I've got to tell you about how I wrote that book and that it took you, I think, 10 years. Um, can you briefly tell us about, um, about what happened there? Well, um, I, you know, I make no bones about the fact that uh, I, I mean to be led by God in what I do. Now, people can judge for themselves whether uh, I, I am, but I, I really had no idea, n not even a dream, that, that I would ever write biographies. And it's, just, it's a long, strange story, but the fact is I never intended to write biographies. I never... Uh, even if somebody had suggested it, I would have said, no, thank you. But it ended up that I was kind of uh, presented with the idea of writing a biography of William Wilberforce, the great hero, the anti-slave uh, trade uh, abolitionist figure in Britain. And so I wrote Amazing Grace about William Wilberforce. And after that, I began to think maybe I would write another biography, maybe. And who would it be? The only one I could think of is Bonhoeffer, because my mother grew up in Germany during the Nazi time. My grandfather was killed in the war. He was not pro-Nazi, but he had to go. And like uh, cannon fodder, was killed at age 31 uh, in uh, April of 44. And it, all of that background uh, is it's my background. It's my life and my, my grandmother, who was uh, one of the closest people to me and who lived through this and everything. So the story of Bonhoeffer kind of haunted me. When I first became a Christian, somebody told me about Bonhoeffer, and I was... I was stunned. I thought, this is a Christian. So this is a man who heroically, because of his Christian faith, stood up for the Jews in Nazi Germany and was killed in a concentration camp because he spoke against Hitler. That's the kind of Christianity I could get behind. That's the kind of a, a hero that I admire. And so I was interested in Bonhoeffer, never dreamt I would write a biography. But all those years later, after I wrote the book on William Wilberforce called Amazing Grace, I thought maybe I should write about Bonhoeffer. And long story short, um, I... I, I wrote about Bonhoeffer, and writing it was a, was a great trial. I talk about it in my uh, subsequent book, Miracles. I kind of tell the story of that. But Can I just interrupt you there? T let, tell people who, who don't know who Bonhoeffer is. Bonhoeffer was a German pastor who got involved in the plot to kill Hitler. Think of this. Here he is, sort of pacifist, serious Christian, and he comes to New York City, and actually, this is really, uh, I mean, it's all in my book, but he goes to the black church in Harlem, and he sees real Christianity. In other words, there was a lot of dead mainline Protestantism already in 1930, just as we see today, just floating along with the zeitgeist. He sees people devoted to Jesus in, in their whole lives, in the way that they worship God in church, uh, with, with passion, and then the way they live it out uh, caring about what somebody would today call social justice, but w w I don't like that term. The point is they cared about living out their faith beyond Sunday. And so Bonhoeffer sees this, goes back to Germany and realizes there's a, there's a parallel with the Jews. The way the Jews are being treated uh, and the racial view of the Nazi party, he knew is fundamentally antithetical to the Bible. You cannot be a real Christian. You know, you can be a Christian who goes to church and is ignorant, but a real Christian understands th what the Bible says about uh, tribalism and racism and so on and so forth. And it, it, it simply says that God is no respecter of persons, that God loves everyone equally. We're all created in his image. So when Bonhoeffer sees the Nazis taking advantage of the biblical ignorance of the German church, most of whom they just went there because that's what one did on a Sunday. He said, somebody has to speak up and has to make clear that if you're a Christian, you cannot allow the Nazis to look along racial lines. I mean, there's so much ridiculous talk about r 
racism in America today. I mean, some of it is not ridiculous, but some of it is ridiculous. If you want to see real racism, you look at the Nazis, they, their entire worldview was fundamentally racist. And so Bonhoeffer says this is wrong. He begins to speak up. And over the course of the 30s, he becomes more and more ostracized and more and more a lonely prophetic voice until finally he realizes the church has failed, which I think m many people see that sometimes. The church is just uh, lacks courage and, and so on and so forth. And he says, I'm going to get involved in the plot to kill Adolf Hitler. In other words, I feel God leading me, he, he felt, um, to get involved in the plot to kill Adolf Hitler. Now, of course, it's not murder. It's, uh, it's like killing Osama bin Laden. It's like David killing Goliath. I mean, this is something that he thought must be done for the sake of the Jews, for those who are suffering. So his story is one of the most heroic, magnificent stories I have ever encountered. And the idea that I had the privilege of writing about it, I mean, it ends up being a 600 page book, but it's such a fascinating story that it would take a lot for me to screw it up. So I, I told it uh, with as much passion uh, as I, I could because I believe so strongly in it. And as you said, it sold a million copies. I, the, the most amazing thing to me is that it was translated into 20 languages which is just extraordinary because it's one of these universal stories. So I'm excited about it. We're making a movie about it. And, you know, that's it's kind of what put me on the map. Um, and strangely, you said uh, earlier, uh, Anne, you know, you want to you want to change the, the subject or change the tone. It leads us right back to what we were just talking about. Um, what is the role of the church when things are going crazy, when the nation uh, in a way, is being tempted toward madness. I think that the PC cultural Marxism we're seeing is just like the descent into madness that many Germans went along with, even if they weren't leaders in it. They were afraid to speak up, and they drifted along with what everyone said, you must do this. You know, uh, I, I, I recently said something that I think uh, many people would be unable to hear, but I said that when you are forced to take a knee, when you are forced to go along with a certain way of thinking, it reminds me of that chilling effect in Germany in the 30s where people said, if you are not heartily pro-Nazi, we, we suspect you. You may lose your job. You better say Heil Hitler with vigor or you will lose your job. You will lose your position in, in the society. People in America are no different than Germans in the 30s because we're all the same. Human beings are the same. And and there's always a temptation to go along with the crowd, to go along with the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes it leads us into madness. And I really think that we need a few courageous voices. The two of you, for sure, are two of them to simply speak truth when it becomes unpopular to speak truth. Uh, I, I really think that that's what's at stake. And so when I wrote the Bonhoeffer book to uh, end, end up this long uh rant, which was meant to be short. When I wrote the book, I had a sense that this was a prophetic story about America. I didn't try to underscore those parallels in my book, but it seems clear to me now that some of the trends that I was picking up in telling the Bonhoeffer story, those seeds are, are everywhere and that eventually they come to fruition. And I think that's kind of what's happening in America now. And so I, I hope that the book will be a wake up call for for uh, for the right readers, people who can see what uh, what they what they need to see. It's a, I mean, it's a, it's a an incredible book. I mean, I, I kind of had a funny experience because I'd I'd heard about it, and I bought it on Kindle, and uh, and people will know, you know, that as you read a Kindle book, you don't you know you know you buy it and you don't know what size it is, right? Because you know whatever it's digital, and I was reading for a long time. And I just glanced down, like maybe three weeks or something, and I looked down and it was like 17%, right, or something, or even less, by the way. And I, and I thought I'd quite read quite a lot, and I thought, God, what, how big is this book? And then, of course, I kind of went online and saw, and I was like, at that point, it, I was like, I'm definitely not, I, I have to keep going, this is amazing. Um, and I cried, and I just think of the, um, I mean, I, I thought it was, and I think I said that to you the time when, when we met, that I thought it was a, a, like a miracle book, like it's like a sacrament. Um, and that scene that kind of is etched in my mind, and I'm sure when you make the movie, and I hope you have tons of control, by the way, when it comes to making the movie, because yeah. to keep what's important, important. But the scene of him saying um, a mass before he went, that he had this, that he, that he asked and was allowed 
to have a service before he and to have communion before he died and the witnesses who lived to tell the tale who lived to describe how he went to the gallows how he how he comported himself and that he was beatific i think that he was um very happy um and knew that he had done the right thing and that he knew he's going to be with god um which we have no doubt about um but it was amazing it's an amazing life and he was so young say you know just to be clear I really felt kind of led into writing it. I cannot claim credit for knowing uh, what I was doing. Uh, I, I think it's only in retrospect that I see clearly that this was something I was meant to write for such a time as this. And I, I, uh, I marvel myself because when I was writing it, it was not a fun process. It was very difficult. And uh, I had no idea that uh, it would, 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 would strike a nerve in the, in the way that it did. The, the 10th anniversary of the publication is this year, and we've just come out with a 10th anniversary edition. Actually, it will come out in a couple of months, and I've written a long uh, new introduction where I sort of talk about things that I didn't get a chance to talk about in the, in the first one. So, so I'm very excited about it, but it's unfathomable to me that it's now been, been 10 years. It just doesn't make any sense. Wow. Wow. And you said you're writing another book. Um, tell us about that. Yeah, I'm always writing books because, I, as I mentioned, I live in New York and I have to pay the rent. So I'm, I'm uh, rarely uh, idle. I, um, I've written a book uh, which will come out, I guess, in January, which is a, it's the story of my life. I've written a lot of biographies, but I wanted to write the story of my life up until my dramatic conversion at age 25. Uh, it's, it's a crazy story. Um, uh, and I, I, I really look forward to, to getting that out. But in the course of the last months, um, I've begun writing a new book, which will come out after that one. And this is called Is Atheism Dead? Uh, as you remember, 1966, Time magazine famously asked the question on its cover, Is God Dead? And what I talk about relates to the Wall Street Journal article you mentioned uh, titled Is Science making the case for God, or science increasingly makes the case for God, there's no question in my mind, none, because I've done the research, that roughly since the 60s, the narrative has changed. In other words, you can see how people might have thought in the 60s, based on scientific evidence and other things, that religion is going away. We're entering a brave new world that's going to be secular and enlightened and rational and whatever they thought that meant. But the narrative has been changing. Um, not only are people increasingly religious, quote unquote, but the evidence for God from science has so dramatically changed since the 1960s uh, and from a number of places in archaeology and so on and so forth that if you had to choose whether we think there's a God who created the universe or there isn't, logic would dictate that you say, yes, there must be. We can debate uh, the details of who God is and so on and so forth. But the evidence is so dramatic. But here's the thing. Because a secular liberal narrative took hold in the 60s, uh, which now is also, as we've said, an anti-American narrative, it's caught uh, the institutions in, 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 in colleges and so on and so forth, all of this evidence over the last five decades has it been ignored or in some cases maybe suppressed. And I realize that when you look at this evidence and you put it together, most people will marvel because they've never heard this. That, that it's just not the kind of thing that the media is comfortable talking about. The fine-tuned universe is probably the most dramatic example that in 1966, you couldn't have possibly known that there are so many things necessary for the existence of a planet like Earth that supports life and so on and so forth. We simply didn't know. Today, we have such a welter of evidence that it, it is, I would say, literally breathtaking, at least for some. When you read it, you think, this is extraordinary. There is no question that we shouldn't be here, that in order for us to be here, for life to exist on a planet like this, requires so many ridiculously stringent uh, conditions, it makes no sense. It's, it's like if somebody says, listen, I flipped a coin and it came up heads. And then I flipped it again and it came up heads. You say, well, that happens. Well, what if I did it 
50 million times and every time it came up heads everybody would say wait yeah yeah something is happening after you flip it 15 <laughs> times and it comes up heads you'd say stop this is not random some what's going on the the science and of course i'm i'm speaking very you know uh, in a surface way right now but it's so dramatic even christopher hitchens when he was questioning he said what's the most dramatic argument for god you know from the other side he said oh without any question the fine-tuned argument and he went on about it that it is really a stunning thing so that's probably the most dramatic uh and simple case for god but i i'm just convinced that uh in the last 50 years the narrative has changed and nobody has really written about it um in a way that covers everything that you know there are certain people who write a little bit about science and this and that but i think your average person is is generally unaware and it is truly shocking and overwhelming and i'm i'm excited as you can tell <laughs> yeah I th well I, th I think a lot of people are going to want to buy that book for other people and maybe for themselves as well w when's the book coming out um we're not quite sure my my the book that i'm writing about uh of my life where i come to faith that should come out in january and i do write most of my books so that people will give them to their friends in other words the story of my my, my life it's called fish out of water a search for the meaning of life. I think that people who are already Christians will say, this is the book that I want to give to my friend who wouldn't read a really Christian book because it's yeah. not a Christian book. What I've written is just a, it's really a literary memoir. And a lot of it is very funny. There's some insane stories that you would almost not believe. But I, I, a lot of the books that I write are to give to people. And the, is Atheism Dead is exactly like that. It's the sort of thing you'd say, I wonder what so-and-so would make of this. And I, I try not to write in a way that's just for the choir. I try to write, you know, for a very yeah. mainstream audience. Without, without spoiling the book, was your journey to faith, was it dramatic in timing? Or was it a slow burn? Did you feel something? What, what happened? A, a little bit of both, but, but the, the culmination of the book, it's, it's really, it's a book about the first 25 years of my life. Because around my 25th birthday, I had a dream. People can go to my own website, ericmetaxas.com. And if you go to ericmetaxas.com, a little below, there's a, a video where I tell the story of the dream. Uh, and I've spoken about it here and there, but it is an absolutely miraculous thing that God spoke to me in a dream in such a way. Now imagine that I'm a you know, I'm, I'm, I'm secular at that point. I don't believe I'm not hostile to God, but neither do I believe that anyone can really know God or, you know, I, and I have a dream that is just mind blowing, you know, almost literally, right. It just completely scrambled my, my head and proved to me God is real. And, you know, it's, it's a whole story and it ties into the title fish out of water, but leading up to that, I wasn't particularly searching for God. I was like most people searching for what's the meaning of life. I'm open to whatever it might be. And so I had some experiences with God or with Jesus, but nothing really dramatic. I was just kind of floating along like the way a lot of people do. I was raised in the Greek Orthodox Church, um, but, you know, I didn't know exactly how to take it. I just thought Greeks go to Greek church. And so that's, you know, that that's part of my life. I'm a, I'm a son of, you know, European working class immigrants struggling in America. Uh, and then I end up going to Yale University, dramatically different from the way I was raised, a whole other world. And so there's a lot of crazy stuff that I think you see in a way somehow the fingerprints of God in some of what happens to me. But it's not at all obvious. But the 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 ending of the book, it really does come a little bit out of nowhere. It's a very dramatic drawing together of everything but i did not see it coming that's an understatement i mean it's really just uh, crazy and i think a lot of people who aren't particularly searching for god just open-minded people will be fascinated with with this journey it's just a journey uh, as many of us have and i said i want to i want to write a literary memoir it's not a religious memoir the ending uh uh is obviously um about God, but I didn't plan it. I didn't see it coming. And so I try to tell it, you know, just uh, as I experienced it, which is pretty crazy. Well, we'll, 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 we'll definitely look forward to it. We're all looking that. forward to it. So um, what's the name of that book again? And it's coming out in January. What's it called? That one is called Fish Out of Water, A Search for the Meaning of Life. 
uh, fish out of water is because I feel like most of my life, I was a fish out of water. You know, I, I was, my mother's from Germany, my father's from Greece. So I grew up in the Greek church, went to Greek parochial school here in New York City. And I never felt Greek enough. I always felt like the strange, you know, my mother's German and we speak English at home. We don't speak Greek. Uh, then when I went to Danbury, Connecticut, which was middle America, uh, I felt European. You know, my parents had raised me in this European way. And suddenly I'm, you know, thrown among people who are deeply American. And again, I felt like a fish out of water. And that happens every time. It happens over and over in my life. It's very strange and in many cases very funny there are some very very funny stories um and i so fish out of water describes me but the end of the story uh with the dream uh touches on a deeper meaning of of the fish out of water and so it's it, it's remarkable to me that it makes sense but as i say i'm just telling what happened in my life and so i can't take credit for uh, the, the, the meaning behind it. I'm just sort of t telling what I experienced. So, so tell us about your children's books. Um... Well, I've written a lot of children's books. I mean, I think I'm, uh, I'm very difficult for people to figure out and, and they, I annoy them. You know, when I wrote the, the Bonhoeffer book, people knew me from the Bonhoeffer book, which is of course very serious, uh, very moving. Um, uh, I think when people experience the other side of me, they, they, they almost feel annoyed <laughs> when you're writing silly children's books, you work for Veggie Tales. That doesn't go along with this image we had of you as the author of Bonhoeffer. And so, yeah, I've written 30 children's books, but Phelan, the funny thing is that very recently, I think they're behind me someplace, I think over there. Yeah, yeah, we can see some of them. I've written three books now. The, the third one is coming out shortly. And these are really books. They look like children's books and they work as children's books because they're not nasty, but they're really books of, of satire. They're, they're meant for adults. They're humorous books. I've written a lot of humor. Um, and they are about a caveman named Donald who, you know, uh, he just gets things done. And it's, you know, it's, it's really obviously a political parable. These are three political parables for our time. But these are humor books, and so adults will get the humor. Yes. There's a, a nasty sorceress named Madam Miss Speaker uh, who wields a gavel, in case you're thinking about what I'm talking about. Uh, there, there are a lot of political figures in the books, and so it's, it's really meant to be funny and to be kind of celebratory of this, this caveman Donald who you know uh, helps these people find freedom and self-government and so on and so forth. But they're written like children's books because... Um, just because we thought it would be funny and, and whatever. But because they're not nasty, kids do love them. Although we didn't write them originally for kids. They are children's books, you know, for, that are meant to be funny for adults. And but the names a lot of people are, them for kids. And the names of those are Donald Drains the Swamp is one, right? The first one is Donald Drains the Swamp. The second one is Donald Builds the Wall. Yeah. And the third one, which uh, people can pre-order, is called Donald and the Fake News. Mm -hmm. uh, it is honestly, they are. You, but you can imagine how angry people are. They say the guy who wrote Bonhoeffer is now writing this these nasty political, you know. And I thought, listen, I, you know, to quote Walt Whitman, "I am large, I contain multitudes." What can I tell you? <laughs> kind of, I've, I've, I've never met a genre I didn't like, and I, I really have written a lot of humor. And if people follow me on Twitter or other places, they know that. You know, I'm I'm a. a but by the a, way, we make we make a big point about because we we and we've, I think we've talked to you about this of going into bookstores all over the country and finding a huge amount of books for children, extremely political books written by the left, very hateful of America, very hateful, obviously, of the president, uh, etc. And it's really refreshing and wonderful to discover your books, uh, which we have obviously given to our. Thank you so much, because I've written son. many I've, I've, I've written many bona fide children's books yes. that are, as you say, uh, meant to celebrate America. I wrote a book called you mentioned Phelan. Uh, it's called Squanto and the, and the Miracle of Thanksgiving. This is a true story that when I discovered it, it, it just. It, it's just obvious that many people, they have a secular, liberal, uh, vaguely anti-American mindset. And when they encounter these facts, they kind of ignore it. 
because it doesn't fit their way of thinking. The story of Squanto and the Miracle of Thanksgiving, which I also wrote about for adults in my book, If You Can Keep It, is one of the most extraordinary, miraculous stories in history. So I put in a children's book. That's been a bestseller. I've written a lot of children's books. I wrote one called Yankee Doodle Mugsy with uh, the same guy who illustrated uh, the Donald books. It's a genuine kid's book, but it's a celebration of July 4th. Um, uh, Tim Raglan is the one uh, really who I've worked on with a number of these books. But I do think it's important for people to understand that the, the mainstream publishing world and the mainstream media and the mainstream of academia, they are all now horribly bent, uh, pervertedly twisted uh, along the lines of this anti-American freedom narrative, usually an anti-God narrative. And I think we have to produce culture, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not just speaking politically and so on and so forth, but create things that people can share with their kids or share with their family. And so a lot of what I do, including these, these kids' books and these humor books, is for that, so that people can have something that they can laugh and, and enjoy and, and not go, you know, along the lines of, of where the culture would take them. So, so how do you live in New York? I mean, uh, producing a Donald's children's book. I mean, uh, d does it lead to some uh, funny incidents where, where people meet you and realize you're the author of the Bonhoeffer book? And then they say, oh, you write children's books? Okay. Oh, you write Donald Trump children's books? Yeah. Uh, I, most of my abuse is online these days. People get very, very angry, angry. If anybody says anything nasty or really unpleasant to me on Twitter, I block them instantly. Uh, because I don't have time for that. People are entitled to their opinions, but look, I, I have to do, I mean, speaking as a Christian, I have to speak the truth as I think it ought to be spoken. I can make mistakes, but I must do my best. Mm -hmm. And like the heroes about whom I have written, I cannot have a fear of man, as the Bible says. I have to do what I think is right. And I do. And I may, as I say, make mistakes. If, if, if I know that I've made a mistake, I will apologize. I will re re retract it. But I'm quite careful, uh, you know, not to say things sloppily. I think if most Americans uh, would follow the example of a Bonhoeffer and, a, and of so many others and not be afraid to speak the truth, even if it means losing your job or losing a friendship, the fact of the matter is the time is short. Uh, what I hear going on in corporate America today, that people are being forced to take, you know, racial sensitivity training or transgender training or so on and so forth. I think people need to stand up and say, listen, that, that's 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 not for here. It's it's not for school, it's not for the workplace. Let me do my job, let me do my thing. And if you force me, you know, to take a knee or to do whatever, um, I, I believe that God will find me a better job at a place where they are not uh, in, indifferent to my um, to my feelings. I, th I think a lot of people have to have the courage to do that. And I said earlier, not to be too dramatic, but unfortunately, I think it's true. In Nazi Germany, people were afraid to speak up. People were afraid not to do what everybody said you must do. And because of that fear, they allowed evil to hold sway and to destroy a nation and millions of human beings. And I have to say that Americans, we ought to know better. And there are enough Americans who do know better. We need to have some spine and need to know that uh, God has your back. Uh, this is not something that, that you have to say, well, I, I better do this or I better do that. No, you don't. It's your choice. But if you choose to, to cringe and to cave in, uh, to evil, well, then you, you become a part of it. You make it that much more difficult for the next person to speak the truth because you've gone along with the, with the, the mob. And I, I do think that this is very serious right, time, right now. I'm very sorry to see it, but I, yeah. I think it is the case. Yeah, no, it's a, no the, the silencing of, of dissent and silencing of people's um, voices is, is, is really horrible. But to move from the sublime, very much the ridiculous here, we ask a couple of questions to all our guests when we come to the end of the interview and we've just come to that point now so we ask people what's their go-to recipe what are you famous for cooking in your house i do cook i just want people to know i know how to cook and i do cook what am i famous for cooking absolutely nothing 
So your family don't ask for anything. They don't say, oh, make your special cookies. Yeah. Nah, I, I think, um, uh, as I say, I, I, I can, I can, uh, I do cook. But uh, the fact of the matter is that the, the cooks in my family who are, who are really, you know, the ones you're going to say, would you please cook? That would be my daughter and my wife. Okay, I accept that. All right. And we also ask people for a piece of art that's, that's important to them, a significant piece of art, like a yeah. poem, a play, a movie, a piece of sculpture. People who know me know that I'm a, a great aficionado of the arts and of culture. And so I could talk to you both for days about this. But I, I wrote a book called If You Can Keep It, which mm -hmm. is if I could give a copy of that book to every American I would if I if I had the money, I would give a copy to every American because in it are the basics of what does it mean to be an American and what we must know to keep the republic. We've been touching on this in this larger conversation. And at the center of that book, I talk about the idea of culture, how the poems and the songs uh, and the stories that we tell, that is who we are. And you really cannot be an American unless you know those stories, unless you know the story uh, of, of George Washington at Valley Forge and, and, and uh, uh, crossing the Delaware, and unless you know the story of Paul Revere and on and on and on, and the story of Nathan Hale. These things are not just for entertainment, but they're central to who we are as a people and ideas need to be communicated in art, not only on news programs and so on and so forth. So when you ask that question, immediately I go to the story, uh, sorry, to the, to the poem, Paul Revere's Ride by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. I wish that every American, and we did this on my radio program uh, where we challenged people to memorize it, but it's, it's a, it's a longish poem, but it is so beautiful and so central to who we are as a people, to the idea of freedom and to the idea that we are called over and over again to listen to the voice that says the British are coming or, uh, you know, w wake up, take arms against tyranny. That poem by, by Longfellow, it is so magnificent. It is so beautiful. I've just read a biography of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and I have to say that there was a time in America where there wasn't a school kid who hadn't heard of that poem and who probably couldn't recite the beginning of it. Uh, I, without any question, would, would pick that, that poem, The Midnight Ride or the, the, the Paul Revere's Ride, which, as I say, it's, it's more than just a poem. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a celebration of freedom and of America and, and Longfellow in our lifetimes has been dramatically underrated. He is one of the greatest poets who ever lived. I think he's going to be experiencing a renaissance because it's, it's about time and this new biography has come out, but that's without a question. That poem is what, what I would pick. Okay. All right. And you say it's quite long. So can you recite it? I, I can. My daughter memorized it when she was eight and I memorized it with her. And it's too long to, to recite here, but it begins, I can, I can do the beginning at least. It's, it starts out, listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to his friend, when the British march, you know what, now, now I'm going to start making mistakes, but... The listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. It is so evocative. And in fact, the book that I wrote uh, that I called Yankee Doodle Mugsy, that poem starts out similarly. It's a poem and it's about, it's, it's a children's book, but it starts out similarly. It's very evocative. And uh, I, the, the Paul Revere's ride poem, I can recite the whole thing probably making a couple of mistakes at this point because I haven't uh, looked at it recently, but it is just, you know, if you want to challenge somebody, say, I'll give you a hundred bucks to the 12 year old. If you memorize that poem, that would be something to do for your country. It's, oh, well. it's funny. Um, Anne's mother uh, also was able to recite a Longfellow poem to stay at home is best. Um, Homekeeping hearts are happiest. 
to stay at home is best. And she used to recite all of that and something about wandering here and wandering there. To stay at home is best. Yeah. And then Phelan famously got a piece of driftwood and got someone to uh, etch onto it to stay at home is best and put it up on our fireplace. So um, that, uh, yeah, so that I would, so as a memory and as a, as I a love the fact that you, you, you love Longfellow. I mean, honestly, he is, it doesn't really get better, but uh, all Revere's ride when I, as a writer and as a poet, I write a whole chapter in my book, if you can keep it, which I would beg everyone to, to get a copy of my book, if you can keep it for, for America, not for me, because it, it helps us. We're going through a tough time in America and we need to understand what's at stake, but I write an entire chapter just on the poem Paul Revere's Ride, on, on on the details of the poem, why he wrote it when he did. He wrote it as the Civil War was beginning to break on America. He understood that we need to be called to arms. We need to be called to stand up for what is right. And my goodness, if ever that poem were important today, again, it is important. So thanks for asking such a great question. Nobody ever asks about recipes or Art. So thank you very much. <laughs> it tell, tells you a little bit about our priorities around here. Yes. But we've come to the end of this has been a wonderful time. Well, I'm no, sorry we've well, taken well, so much of well, your time. Well, where can people get you? What, what uh, website, uh, Twitter? It couldn't be easier to find. EricMetaxas.com. Uh, if you can spell Metaxas, it's Greek. EricMetaxas.com. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Parley. I'm on Gab. Uh, I'm on Instagram. And uh, I have a show on YouTube, of course, and across the country on radio and podcast, Eric, the Eric Metaxas show. Yes. I interview amazing people, including the two of you. Uh, it's a really wide, wide variety of guests, but it's just the Eric Metaxas show and uh, YouTube is uh, where they can see it. And on weekends, you'll see a half an hour of it on TBN. Thank, thanks for asking. I do pe hope people will go to my website, ericmetaxas.com. They can find everything we've been talking about there. Well, great. this has been great. Thank you so much, Eric. We really appreciate your time. It is my honor. Thanks to, to both of you for everything you're doing. Hope to see you soon. I hope so too. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, that was great. I mean, that was really, really wonderful. And, and can I just recommend to everyone, please buy Eric Metaxas' books, particularly his books, by the way, for yourself. I would recommend Bonhoeffer very much. It's a, t it's, it's, a heavy, it's a heavy read, but he's written lots of other books as well, by the way, and he's got two new books coming out that, we'll, that we've obviously just heard about. Um, and I would recommend if you've got small and short people in your life, make sure you get Eric Metaxas books for them and support the work that he is doing, the incredible work that he's doing um, to tell the, the true and the beautiful story of America. Um, now, one thing that Eric disappointed us with was um, I had asked him for a recipe, and as you say, he was rather reluctant, and he didn't really give us mm. a recipe. So not very know, giving. Mr. He wasn't McCarthy. very giving on the recipe front, and I think obviously I think he's too embarrassed because I think he is living with his wife, who is a brilliant cook, and his daughter, who is there at the moment because of the fact of the COVID, she's had to come home from school. So I have a recipe. Um, a little bit of a cliche here because obviously during the pandemic, I'm one of those people who. Um, did search out a banana bread recipe and I found a really simple one that I really liked and I made it I had bought two little cute uh, wrought iron pans that I kind of because mm. Phelan likes those like cute little kitchen things yeah. and I'd never really found a good use for them until I had this recipe so it's basically uh, two eggs beaten um, a third of a cup of yogurt um, three mashed bananas, one cup of brown sugar, one and three quarter cups of all-purpose flour, one teaspoon of baking soda. By the way, the recipe will be also will be up on the YouTube channel. Half a teaspoon of salt and a half a cup of roughly broken pecans. You could even put in more pecans, to be honest, by the way. And you heat the oven to 350 and you beat together all of the wet ingredients first. That's, then you, that's the egg, yogurt and bananas. And then you sift the sugar, flour, baking soda and salt and you then you know you sift them together and then you add the wet to the dry but fold them in you know fold them which is going it's scooping around the corner you don't beat the life out it's of it. not stirring it's folding so you folding. Keep, try and keep air and i was a cheap folder Philip was a cheap folder and i then i did come along when he thought he had finished and i folded a little bit and we did find some dry ingredients that hadn't been folded in properly the fold. and then you what i did was and you'll see the photographs coming up right now i put the mixture into these two wrought iron dishes and look at how delightfully they came out and then i think you, it's all in the fold if you want to be decadent which we're clearly in the middle of a pandemic or whatever we are certainly doing that i would have them 
have it warm, have it with gorgeous butter. And of course, the only butter that will ever be used in this house is Kerrygold, which has salt in it and it is grass fed cows. And make yourself a beautiful caffeinated drink and enjoy. And when you eat that banana bread, think of the person who baked for you when you were younger. Um, and it's an important time right now for us to find the joy in the little things. And I'm certainly thinking when I bake of my mother and how much joy she brought to us and how the, sm the smell of her cooking was all over the place all the time. You'd come around the side of the house on the bicycle and you'd be hit on the head with the smell of gingerbread. She made gingerbread, you know, she made short crust, sh short, short, what do you call that? Short cake. Mm, short cake. Short bread. Oh. God, we should try that. Now, by the way, full of butter. But sure. eat that and enjoy. And we'll talk to you next week. Well, actually, I just wanted to say, we got the banner made and you can see the, the pictures of it on YouTube and we were on Fox. The banner cost almost $1,000. We had to hire a drone guy. We had to, you know, it took a lot of work and time and money. Uh, but it was very important that we got the message out there. We got... To, to tell people. Well, what was we great got, was that Phelan was on, the, you were on Fox News yes. right before the president spoke from so, Mount so, Rushmore. You know, something like, something like five million saw that, that there's hypocrisy in these lockdowns, that there's capriciousness and tyranny. And we want to get that message out there. So we need your help to, to pay for these banners, to pay for the drone footage, just to make sure. To keep us going. To keep us going. So give whatever you can to the unreportedstorysociety.com. Uh, we love our sustaining members, sustaining by the way. Sustaining members. We're, a lot of, we're getting more and more sustaining which members. Which is great. Which is People where you give whatever it is that you can every month. Yeah. And it just... It helps us plan. Yeah. And it means we can think about things in advance as opposed to trying, you know... That we're not going cap in hand the whole time. Yes. So please give whatever you can. We really appreciate it. And we know you've stepped up in the past. So We're so grateful. Please keep doing it. And thank you very much. And see you next see week. See you next time. Bye. Bye.